Um, hi, everyone. Uh, maybe I'll start with a kind of quick kind of background and introduction um, to me. So uh, here we are. Uh, so I, I grew up in London. Um, my background's probably best described as a misspent youth with computers. Uh, Microsoft systems engineer and Cisco networks engineer. Um, but along the way, spent a lot of time in the mountains. My family is from the half of my family is from the Swiss Valley, uh, a tiny village called Nax, uh, if, if any of you know that, uh, in the Val d'Erin. Um, and uh, I, I kind of built my company, first company out of my bedroom, uh, building networks and uh, infrastructure for businesses just when companies were getting set up with the first email addresses. And it was kind of a good exercise in building a business in a rising tide. And I think I was just in the right place at the right time more than anything. Um, and at, at some point in about kind of 2010, 2011, we, we ended up selling that company. And my plan was to move here to Chamonix um, and become a mountain guide. So I, I started um, getting very much more into kind of mountaineering and ski mountaineering and doing the kind of list for the guide scheme. Uh, and my plan was to start Swiss guide scheme. Um, but um, actually it's kind of, Topical, this is an Eagle Ski Club, club um, presentation because um, actually uh, in some, in, well, no small part, thanks to the Eagle Ski Club, that plan kind of backfired because um, whilst trying to get more and more ski, skiing, ski mountaineering in to kind of get the experience to do the guide scheme, I met, um, met Dave um, uh, actually at the Westway climbing wall, I think originally, and, and we got... Um, we got talking about a ski trip together that, that Dave was planning. And so we, um, we, we, well, Dave put together a, a fantastic uh, Eagle trip uh, to uh, the Procletier region in, uh, in Albania, kind of border of Albania and Montenegro. Um, and this is us on, on, on this first trip. And it was, uh, it was absolutely awesome. We had like an absolutely amazing time. Um, and the, the thing that was kind of interesting about it was, we didn't really have any maps. I think we, we might have had some old Russian um, maps that were, that were we had of the region, but mostly kind of photographs and, and Google Earth pictures. And, uh, and that's what we used to have this, this great trip. And it was, it was so good that, um, that, we, that we very soon after started planning the next one, this was 2010. Um, and, and so off we went to, um, I think Dave talked a little bit about uh, ski touring in Turkey uh, recently. And um, so off we went to, to Turkey, to, to the Aladar, um, where we, we, we were very excited about this incredible trip we got planned. You can see us down here at the bottom, uh, very, very excited about uh, the fact that we were, we, we were going we to basically ski this whole region uh, in a week. We'd, we were so confident about how fast and furiously uh, and light we would move uh, that we'd taken a two man tent uh, for three of us. And we thought this was a, this was a very good idea uh, because then we could move faster and cover more ground. Um, but, uh, but unfortunately um, we didn't, things didn't quite go to plan. We basically arrived on the first day of, of a seven day storm. I don't think I've ever been in such a big storm. You can see Dave here uh, digging out the tent. Uh, you can see us looking pretty unhappy uh, a lot happy, a lot less happy than before. After three of us had spent seven days in um, a two-man tent, uh, literally barely able to to leave the tent, um, and uh, and and really had <laughs> had nothing to do. Um, and there was these are the days with no internet connection, so we had a lot to talk about um, during during these these <laughs> these seven days. Uh, every morning, thinking that the sky might clear, uh, but 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 no, it didn't. And um, I'd like to say that that's where we kind of hatched the plan for Fat Map, um, but uh, but it's much less glamorous actually. We, Dave and I had a had a had a had a uh, some kind of I don't know bad luck with the weather because um, it was actually I think probably the pivotal moment was uh, sitting in a car park in Pembrokeshire whilst trying to go rock climbing um, and and not being able to go rock climbing. Dave started telling me about. Um, how uh, his vision for evolving maps, particularly for mountains, um, and that topographic maps were, were really kind of an abstraction um, and f fantastic in a kind of physical format. They were one abstraction to answer many, many different questions. But when it came to skiing, ski mountaineering, and, and, and particularly other mountain activities, there were many questions that were quite hard to answer from that. And so we kind of got talking about advances in technology and how 
uh, things like Google Earth were essentially uh, the foundation to kind of virtual worlds and being able to like what what would happen if we we tried to build actually a digital platform uh, to do mapping much better for mountains and um, you know particularly I think what's interesting is is that until like at that point really the only outdoor maps that existed so in our urban environment we had Google Apple uh, and and others build um, being here um, build kind of map platforms for urban environments that were global dynamic contextual real-time searchable but we were still really stuck with, with with topographic maps in the outdoors as the best tools and they were quite technical tools and sometimes quite hard to understand I don't know if um if anyone if anyone knows what the what this mountain is It's, what, it's one of the kind of interesting observations here. Yeah, well, they, 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 trust Dave because they, they, Dave can definitely ring that. It is, it is the Matterhorn. But it's amazing how when you look at essentially what is a perfect representation in topographic map, um, to, it's actually quite hard to recognize, like probably the most iconic recognizable shape. And so a lot gets lost in translation, I guess, on these, these topographic maps uh, for a lot of people. And particularly like uh, now, I think like these, our sport is moving into the mainstream uh, and, and, and we, we want to get to start talking about how we could make decision-making more reliable, give people the confidence to explore uh, and really make the whole thing more accessible and safer. Um, and so, um, you know, off, off we set, that was, that was obviously um, going to be um, easy, we thought naively, we thought we'd just get some data, uh, we'd put this all together and, and we could do this. But like all great um, mountains, actually, like bu building companies is kind of very the same. It's, it's, uh, it's always much, much harder than you think it's going to be, um, as, as Ryan Holdmesser said. So, and there were kind of a number of, um, like, key problems that we quickly encountered uh, along the way, which, which were the kind of first real barriers to why someone hadn't done this before. And what, uh, one, of the, one of the key problems is actually finding really good data. Um, one of the key things you can kind of see being illustrated here is the data that was available um, for uh, the kind of topography of the world was very, very low resolution. Um, it's produced by NASA, it's freely available to everyone. And it looks kind of nice uh, when you're looking at things from a distance, but it doesn't allow you to make decisions in uh, mountainous terrain properly, the way we, we, we need to when we're whiskey mountaineering. And so, um, you know, we were scratching our head about this. And I think uh, every journey, big adventure, um, you know, company needs, needs a bit of luck. And somehow I think we, we we got talking to all the different satellite companies which were mostly interested in selling their data to defense and government applications and the data was also like way more expensive than we thought it would we, we, we dreamed it would ever be um, at the time I think uh, somewhere between 25 and, and 84 dollars uh, per square kilometer um, but but we we happen upon this um, the skier in at Airbus um, who took pity on us, I thought, and, and think he thought this this actually could be kind of interesting and helped us uh, get the first data together to build our first map. Um, and our first map was of the Grand Monte uh, in Chamonix. And uh, so what, what we did to build that map was uh, rather than use the freely available low resolution data was take what we call stereoscopic satellite imagery. So, so high resolution images from uh, two different angles and use that to compute uh, a terrain model. And so rather than having uh, the, the a very, very coarse model, you get the result that you see here, which is a very, very detailed model of the terrain. Um, and that's obviously great because it suddenly looks more realistic, uh, but it also allows you to, to, to kind of understand the information much better. Um, the, the second kind of major problem we had was building the rendering engine. And so the, the first product, actually the one you can see playing here, we, we built on a gaming engine uh, called Unity 3D. Um, and this allowed us to, to start like building like the first maps. Um, and so we, we, we kind of built like 
our first product, I kind of call it our Tesla Roadster, because it was a very, very uh, like, well, niche product, first of all, for off-piste skiing and for ski resorts. Uh, and that's the only data we've managed to get with the small budgets that we had. Um, but uh, the, the reason I kind of call it the Roadster is because whilst it was really never going to be in and of itself that first product a very scalable business it allowed us to like get the right geographic data figure out how to render it on a mobile device understand how we would add and integrate content on top because this is something that at the time didn't really exist like maps were just maps and the content that we used you know the routes that we would have would be in guidebooks and we'd always have to manually translate them and part of what we wanted to do was was see if we could join those dots together to to make uh the the act of planning uh much much easier and simpler but also then navigating on the mountain uh, and making making decisions um and i think the truth is this stage probably took um maybe maybe five or maybe ten times as long as we thought it would um and pro probably we wouldn't really be here if we had if we um if we hadn't had the kind of so a, a good a good good friend said once said that to, to 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 build a great company you have to compete in three markets and the obvious one is your customer market uh, and so obviously you have to build a great product that people love um the 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 second one is the talent markets because you have to build find great people who are actually capable of building the the, the product uh, or service that you're trying to build and 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 there we also had a bit of luck finding finding some of the world's experts in 3d mapping to join us along the way through kind of a bit of serendipity uh, and fortunate timing um the third one is the capital markets because these these things as as we quickly discovered were way more expensive to build than we we thought they were um and instead of taking about a year to build uh, uh kind of the, the 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 outdoor map technology uh that, that that would be able to go broaden these kind of four or five resor resorts uh, it, it took about probably close to five years. And so we found a number of venture investors and capital partners uh, to back that along the way. Some of the kind of notable people who, who helped build that were Michael Halber, who was the uh, CEO of Nokia Maps uh, and helped us kind of put together uh, a team in Berlin uh, and, and beyond to, of, of people who knew how to build map platforms. Um, but also uh, people like um, uh, Jaguar Land Rover's uh, InMotion Fund, who kind of understood what we were doing for kind of off-trail activities, uh, some outdoor brands like Mammoth and Narona, um, and then other, other kind of capital partners who, who joined to, to help support that journey. Um, and eventually, we kind of got the tech working. Um, but the next stage was kind of, so we had this kind of finally built like what, what we thought was kind of the foundation for an outdoor map. Um, but the, the next thing is you have to actually have to build a product that people can use. So um, uh, one of the things we did to try and see if put this to the test was, was take it to Greenland. Uh, so this is um, the, the area of Kulasuk in Southeast Greenland. Uh, and we, uh, the, the map you can see actually on the right is pretty much the only map that existed of the area. It's a one to 250,000, um, it's basically a road atlas, uh, not, not much good for, for skiing, but we, we instead took the, the mapping technology that we'd built and actually went and, and, and created the first real digital map of, of the area that, that you could use to do anything more than, than visualization. And so here we mapped uh, the, the, glace, uh, the, the travel across the sea ice, um, the areas that we were supposed to avoid, the little huts that, that, um, that were there along the way, and, 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 and off we went. Um, and this was us putting the kind of first product to the test. Um, and it was part magic and part um, way too early <laughs> because um, the minute you take your phone out in the cold, uh, the devices that in those days would probably last. In fact, uh, I think this, this, is a, this is a nice picture for, for promotion, but I think we had about four minutes before the phone would just turn off because it, it was too cold. And this was a, an iPhone, the first iPhone 6, I think we're holding here. Um, and so what, you know, there was always this kind of uh, chicken and egg of the technology uh, kind of make, making the product that we were building usable. Um, 
the the processing required to, to run the 3d map was was so heavy it would drain the battery very fast as well um but um but I, but one of the things that it, it proved i think on that trip was that it it, it actually works we where we were standing there at the top of this this line and we managed to ski a line uh, that was quite complex through um, a, a kind of bunch of complicated terrain um, that hadn't been skied before and, and purely down to the fact that this this map was actually something we could use to to navigate and ski and, and here's Stuart also Eagle Ski Club uh, member uh, enjoying enjoying the goods and I think Probably the the uh, this is some of you will know uh, John Griffith and Ali at Swinton. This is them on the, the waiting to be helicoptered off the north face of the, the Grand Jurass, I think. Um, but uh, but but I think you know John's probably the, the man I know who's been to the Grand Jurass more than more than anyone. Uh, and really, I think it's true that you've only really failed if you stop trying. And I think uh, we probably should have given up about. 10 times, but somehow um, we, we really believed that, there were, that we could kind of make this work. And uh, so we, we kind of, the, the confidence we got from kind of using the product in, in Greenland kind of made us think, okay, what do we need to do now to turn like this, what we call this kind of Tesla roads, this kind of prototype more than anything into a global outdoor map. And so that was kind of the product journey we've, we've been on. We, we raised some more capital. Um, we built, we turned this kind of mapping technology that was great, where we could build a map for any area, but wasn't really scalable, um, and uh, managed to acquire data for the whole world uh, that we could use to build uh, a global map for the outdoors. Um, and, and ultimately, uh, we knew that that would kind of be the canvas on which we needed to build all of the kind of other things that are useful for the outdoors. So condition reports and routes and build a community around that with, with a long-term vision to, to build really everything anyone needs to make the outdoors more accessible from, I guess, wanting to be outdoors to being there. Uh, whether that's, uh, of course, like the map, the route, but ultimately, uh, whether that's the equipment or the guide uh, or more. And so the, the, the long-term vision we really had was to build like what we call the home of outdoor adventure, to really not just build something that was really good for people who wanted to go ski touring in Greenland, but build something that made the whole outdoors way more accessible uh, to everyone. And we, we, we thought that one of the kind of important aspects of that were rather than just having a tool um, building a product that connected the whole life cycle from discovery to planning. So actually discovering routes, actually having everything you need at your fingertips to, to, to plan, um, seamlessly translate that to navigating on, on the trail, and then ultimately being able to share your experience and what you've done to hopefully help someone else do, do the same. Uh, and, and, and we really, the vision was to build that for for, for all activities and, and, and all seasons. And after quite some, quite some years, I think it was about 2018, uh, to the end of 2018, beginning of 2019, when suddenly we, we kind of hit this inflection point where the, the, the bugs had been ironed out, um, the technology had caught up, uh, you know, the battery technology, iPhone processing, screens were more usable in, 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 in the outdoors uh, due to their brightness and, uh, and, and touch screens performing much better in the cold. And suddenly the, the product became usable and there was this kind of inflection point where um, we just started getting adoption across the world. And so today we have about 600,000 users active per quarter. Um, and now that the kind of world is coming back to life, but we've about two and a half thousand new people signing up to, to FatMap and about a hundred thousand um, routes or itineraries that you can discover all over the world. Um, but one of the kind of key challenges we realized is how long tail uh, the outdoors is. And even with hundreds of thousands of routes, um, there was just so many important places we weren't scratching the surface. And so this is something, this is where we realized we had to build a, an active community uh, that wasn't just using that map as a tool, uh, but actually contributing 
uh, experiences that would be discoverable by others. And we that's really one of the things we've been working on uh, a lot for the last kind of uh, 18 months or so, uh, two years of, of COVID, where we kind of hunkered down and started trying to build the next, next phase of the product. So now I'll talk a little bit about like what FatMap is today and, 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 and where it's going next. Um, so the, 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 the kind of at the very heart of it, it's a, it's a global 3D map for, for the mountains. And that's the kind of technology that we've built. You can kind of see here, you've got every trail peak um, integrated with uh, the landscape uh, for both summer and, and winter. Uh, so in, in ski areas, obviously you'll have uh, uh, runs. Uh, we have, and, and lifts, we also have live status. So you can see whether those lifts are open. So where Google would have traffic information, we'll, we'll tell you whether the lifts are running um, and, and starting to integrate, not just the landscape, not just the trail data and reference data, but also uh, the, the live information on top. Um, and then on top of that, we've got these 100,000 routes where you can uh, discover them. Uh, many of them contributed by the community, like you can see here, you can explore them in, in 3D. Uh, this was kind of the, the first kind of killer feature, I think that was that people enjoyed, which was being able to fly through your route. And, and something about seeing where you were going to go in this way made it much, much easier to plan and probably a way we didn't really realize at the time. Um, something else we did was because we were very kind of aware that there were so many different places. There was like huge amounts of fragmentation and there were lots of places people would look for information. So we started aggregating lots of different data sources. So things like camp to camp, um, there, there are platforms like Outdoor Active where um, tourism organizations are, are contributing data, brands are, are adding data. And we're basically aggregating uh, also uh, routes and other things that are contributed to the OpenStreetMap network. We're aggregating as much data as we can into one single search engine. Um, so hopefully that means, uh, you know, over time, any route or destination you search for will, 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 have, uh, will have content. And then of course, um, you can, navigate on the fly, uh, you, can, you can save places, you can share them with people, um, and all of the things that, that um, you would now are kind of can do in quite a lot of different outdoor apps. But we're trying to kind of more and more kind of aggregate everything you need in, in one place. So this is kind of, of course, national topographic maps from France. We've now, I think, more than 10, uh, and we're adding more and more all the time. So you can see, uh, you know, the, the national topographic maps over the landscape as well. And then one of the key differences, I think, to, to the platform we built was that rather than being a uh, Basically, every every map platform that's been designed up until now, all the other map platforms have been designed for urban environments. And so this is they're able to display data, but they're not really computational maps. So that means you can't actually calculate anything uh, from there. And a lot of the choices, particularly in skiing, but in mountain sports, like we're making decision about the terrain that we travel through. Um, so one of the key dif differences uh, in FatMap was that you could actually um, analyze the terrain uh, and actually get information that's, that's as, that improves every time we update the terrain data in the map. So here you can see uh, obviously the slopes based on gradient that's relevant to, to, to avalanche risk. Um, you can see uh, gradient heat maps, uh, so kind of easier to read the terrain. Um, you can see aspect kind of much more clearly in a very kind of granular way. So you can find those like pockets of, of, of north facing terrain in, in uh, where the snow stayed cold for, for, for longer and more easily. Um, and, and then right down to actually being able to, um, to, to, to search for terrain specifically. And this is a feature we're, we're in the process of improving. So you can actually put multiple inputs in, but let's say you wanted to find uh, terrain that was uh, under 40 degrees uh, from say uh, north, uh, 
northwest through to northeast. Uh, and here you'll actually be able to highlight that terrain on the map. So whether that's terrain you want to avoid or whether that's terrain you're particularly looking for, uh, you can start to, to, to use that in the kind of decision making. Um, obviously, all of the things that you would expect, like offline mapping. Um, and then more and more, we're starting to add real-time data. So we have snow, live snow in um, Europe and North America. Um, soon we'll, we'll actually have live snow cover globally. Um, but uh, here you can literally see that the, this is daily updated uh, across Europe and North America, and also things like uh, how much recent snowfall has there been somewhere and, uh, and how much uh, for snowfall is forecast. Uh, and we, all of this data comes from lots and lots of different places, and we aggregate it all together um, from multiple different providers so that there's kind of one view, uh, aggregate view in, in FatMap. So one of the things we then started doing to try and populate uh, more, more, more route information was allow people to track their outings um, and add photos that, like you can see here that are geolocated. So you can start to see, okay, where was that photo? Um, and, and you can start to understand like maybe visually some of the conditions uh, and where they are. Um, but also we, we did some other integrations with Garmin, Sunto and Strava uh, so that people could automatically import their outings, partly to see it for themselves. Um, but this is kind of the foundation for, for some of the, the, the stuff that's, that's, that's coming next. Um, so one of the big ones is, is uh, mobile route planning. So it's probably the most requested feature. Um, and that's actually launching next week. Um, so you'll be able to plot a route uh, on the mobile, as you can see here. We'll uh, start try and estimate time, et cetera. Uh, and you can just literally drop points and uh, save those routes and have them offline automatically on the mobile device. Uh, the, the first version allows you to route across paths and the uh, version that about two weeks later, you'll be able to do all of the kind of planning you can on the web version today um, off, off trail. Um, the second thing that's uh, coming that's related to the kind of community activities is um, allowing people to contribute condition information. So um, we've kind of got now the foundation for the map, the canvas, the activities, um, but allowing people to enrich them with better information. So uh, something we're building at the moment is uh, every time you track something, whether that's on your watch or the mobile app um, uh, or, 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 uh, or Strava, uh, you'll be able to actually enrich that automatically adding the photos that will be geolocated along the way, uh, adding kind of any tags or, or condition information, uh, and then ultimately, um, you know, write any comments uh, such that those things then get saved for the rest of the community to discover. Um, and so some of the ways that, that then we're going to stitch this together to make kind of planning easier is we're also uh, building a, a database of points of interest. So one of the challenges with a lot of uh, the existing digital outdoor maps is they use a um, basically they use mapping that's designed for urban environments. So things like mountain huts are not visible generally on the map until you zoom really far in. And so we're now building our own index of all of the points of interest that are relevant to outdoor information. So you'll be able to see and search them uh, in a much um, better way. Uh, but on top of that, they'll be connected to all of the rest of the information. So this is an example where uh, there's a point of interest uh, which uh, will become community enabled so people will be able to comment uh, on that point of interest to leave information for others uh, but also you can see the recent activities that went through that point of interest so if you if you click on a hut you'll be able to see maybe the recent tours that went through there uh, for example and so that hopefully starts to kind of connect that whole process of people sharing what they do but also um, connecting it to to, to planning um, We've, all, we've also started, um, some of you who are in Chamonix might have seen this, we've, we've ran, been running a test for the past month, um, and this is something we're going to roll out um, wider across the community, so, so condition updates uh, from um, local either guiding companies or guides, um, which link to the actual community activity um, that, that will be available for members, and so we'll be 
building that for next season after the the trial we've done here in Chamonix, which has um, been probably the single feature that we've had the most positive feedback about. Um, this one was in partnership with La Chaminade, but we also had some local mountain guides kind of contribute to the to the updates uh, as well. And then I know a lot of you on the call use the product, and so I hope probably. Um, these are the things that are most requested, all of which basically will be done uh, over the next few months. So there'll be live webcams, you'll be able to uh, track and share your location live. Um, lots of people have been asking for the top of maps to be offlineable, um, be able to upload GPX files. And th this has kind of been part of the, the, the kind of last piece of the puzzle where we built the technology, but really now completing the product functionality that makes, makes the, the, the whole thing usable um, and more device integrations. Uh, we're looking at how we, we can integrate with the things like the inReach and stuff at the moment as well. Um, but probably the one we're most excited about, and um, we hope to have this out before the end of the season, um, is we, we, you can see that you've probably seen in the app, we've built something called recent community activity. So anywhere you are, you can see uh, recent things done by the community. And it's, it's okay now, you can kind of see things that people have done like uh, this uh, tour up uh, uh, the, the, the forest at Grand Monte um, by Mark Chase. Um, but we're, we're working on something um, a bit more exciting. So this uh, it, we, we pulled today. So this, this is, shows you live, this is the last three days of ski touring in Chamonix. Um, and this will be available anywhere in the world. Um, and this is kind of a result of all of the work we've done um, over the past uh, kind of 24 months doing the tracking integration, being able to like render this data on mass. Um, and it, it looks a little bit like a kind of heat map that you might be familiar with in products like Strava. Um, the, the key difference is all of these are actually individual activities and you'll be able to search and filter uh, them and also select uh, individual uh, items to see them. Uh, and so literally be able to control the time range. Uh, and um, today we've built an index of about 26 million um, uh, outings in, in the platform. That's growing by, um, to, give, to put it in perspective, uh, at the beginning of the year, we had about 12 million. Uh, so in two months, we've added about another 13 or 14 million uh, user activities. And so we, we expect that will continue to ramp up. And so we, we've, you can literally, there's, there's pretty much nowhere in the world, over the, just in January, we could see uh, thousands and thousands of activities in far flung places, uh, Iceland, even Greenland, uh, in, in, in January, there's, there's people active. And so here you can literally see um, and where people have been this weekend uh, in Chamonix, which, which is kind of exciting as a way to make decisions about where you might go um, or maybe even contact the person who went there to ask for kind of more information. All right. Um, I guess like probably, um, the, the the kind of last bit of the puzzle maybe is is, is the probably the, the the most important thing or, or the thing that's enabled like most of what we've done is the is the is the team um and i think this the thing that takes the longest to build probably a bit like finding great mountain partners that, that you can't find them overnight um and you know over the last seven years we've been building the company we've now uh, got a team of about 40 fantastic people um, built across kind of product design, but principally engineering, um, building the map platform, the rendering engines, and, and of course, like the mobile and web apps. And uh, last year, we opened an office in, in Chamonix. So this is the HQ. Um, we're, we're still growing the team. So if, uh, if anyone fancies a uh, um, a change of scenery, or uh, or, or um, coming to coming to work from Chamonix, please, please, uh, you know, keep an eye out for for the positions we're putting out there. Um, probably another 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 quick um, plug before we kind of switch to questions is uh, we're running a 
promotion uh, to, to raise money for Protect Our Winters at the moment with the North Face. Um, and so anything you track in FatMap, whether you do that through your watch uh, and you tag with Elevate for climate um, will raise money uh, for Protect Our Winters. So um, I think we're donating a euro for every 100 meet vertical meters. So um, yeah, please get involved. Uh, you don't have to actually, you don't have to be in any particular location. You can do this anywhere uh, and it doesn't even have to be ski touring. So. Um, Please help us get some vertical meters in uh, for uh, for protect our winters and climate change. And then, finally, for anyone who hasn't used the app, uh, wants to, uh, if you scan this QR code, it will take you to a URL. Um, I think we can also share the URL after this. Uh, if you enter your email address, you'll get a 30 day voucher. Uh, so you can use all of the premium functionality, the offline maps, the live snow data, um, and uh, all the premium functionality for a month. All the user functionality that you're building into it, how do you keep it at the point where it's usable, it's not overwhelming? Because I can see a moment where there's enough to be interesting, but you can still work out what's going on. And then a moment where there's just a tidal wave of people's input washing across everything. And it could become really quite hard to find anything. Um, so I'm just going to, I'll stick up the QR code again um, in a minute, Ella, thanks. So how do we manage, um, to be honest, the, that, that is the biggest product problem we have. I'm not, I'm not sure we were happy with how well we've done it yet, if I'm really honest. Um, the, the, the big problem in like outdoors is there's so many different use cases and everyone has so many different preferences. So actually some of the stuff I didn't mention that we're building at the moment is a 2D mode. So we know there's a lot of people would prefer to use their map in 2D. And, uh, and there's, there's a whole load of kind of individual preferences like that. So building a product that answers all of those questions without it becoming a jumble of buttons um, is, a, is a big challenge. Honestly, it's, we don't think it's simple enough yet, and it's really hard to strike the balance between building like an, a tool that's great for experts, um, but also something that makes it accessible uh, for more people. Because in the end, I think that's really... Where did you lose me? Um, you were just talking about the complication of making it accessible to experts and accessible to general public and managing the volume of information. Okay, um, so I, I think that's just something we're constantly working on uh, all, all the time to try and create like a simpler interface. Um, and we're about to do release some other things there to make the product more suggestive of value rather than have to go dig for it in menus. Uh, so they will become contextual prompts. So for example, when you're looking at certain things, it might prompt you to turn on the avalanche layers. Um, some of the things we're doing is to remind people when they're looking at a route, uh, if it goes, for example, through avalanche terrain to actually stick a warning on the route card rather than have to have someone go and actually look in, in the details. So it's kind of, that's, I guess, the art of like product and, and, and user interface interface design and then in the content it's kind of even harder we we started off with too little content and then very quickly in i mean some places we still have too little content but then in some places like chamonix we should probably have too much uh, where it just becomes uh, slightly overwhelming so we're doing two things there one is for what we call routes which are basically the kind of itineraries you would find in a guidebook um, we're going to start moderating those more and um, curating uh, them better into kind of a, a selected list. So there's only one of every kind of classic entry the way you would find in a guidebook. Um, and then for user activity, um, we're going to allow people to uh, filter that through uh, the inputs that are provided in the conditions update. So if someone's tagged it with a particular uh, with, the, with a particular th thing or note, and this kind of applies to summer or winters, if it was tagged with, I don't know, uh, family friendly or something, um, then, then you could actually filter by those tags rather than by the technical information. And that should allow, to find, find, uh, allow people to find the content that meets, suits their interests better. Right, at the beginning, Misha, you mentioned the fact that you were trying to develop the platform to account for other sports, such as cycling or things like that. But each sport has its own particularity and demands and things like that. And so my initial concern was therefore that it becomes, um, you start developing into other areas and the core 
development of the mountaineering and the ski touring sports to be affected. And is that likely to occur, or is it your main core going to be mountaineering, ski touring, and that type of thing? Yeah, thanks. Great question. Um, so I, I think we're very, very much focused on what we would call mountain sports. So um, even if we're broadening into other activities like uh, mountain biking, trail running, et cetera, we're very much focused on uh, activities that happen in the mountains today and solving problems for those. Um, we will, the, the way we think about the, the problem we're solving is, is allowing people, like kind of reducing the friction from people wanting to go outdoors to, to being there. And we, we, kind of building that as a community that helps other people discover uh, those things. And so we think of it more about discovery and experience than, than for example, um, I mean, you mentioned cycling, but there are other, there are different kinds of cycling that people like to do. So I think like Strava, for example, is probably like the number one platform if you care about your performance. Uh, and we're not going to go anywhere near uh, that. It's like a fantastic product if you like to measure yourself uh, against others and 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 focusing on fitness or, or performance. Whereas what we want to do for those activities is, is make them easier for people to discover and experience through other people's community activity. Um, but at the core, the tools we'll build will be orientated towards uh, mountain sports, but not uniquely uh, ski mountaineering or mountaineering. Could we catch, you know, can we filter out if we have people who are contributors that we, you know, are a group of contributors whose interests align with ours, particularly? Can you filter in that way? Yes. So um, we, at the moment, we were doing today, what you can do is you can filter for what we call Fat Map Select, which is basically a like high quality set kind of a mark of quality that we've added to the content. Um, generally, that means that uh, particularly if it's a, a ski mountaineering or mountaineering content, that content's either been produced or reviewed by a mountain guide. Um, so it's its correctness uh, is, is essentially kind of validated. Um, I think what you're asking for is to kind of have have a, a, a potentially content or activity from a, a subset of kind of people you trust. Um, uh, that's something we're working on uh, for for later this year. So, um, yeah, watch watch this space. Hello, um, I have a question regarding the um, the route development that you're talking about. So you mentioned earlier that you're trying to develop more routes um, for the areas that have. Um, less developed, let's say, root um, information. Uh, what are the programs that you have in place? Like, I think you mentioned brands, like do you have guides that you're soliciting? Kind of what's that um, model that you've created um, and how can, we, how can we leverage that? Yeah, thanks, good, good question. This is something we've not done in a structured enough way until now, but literally something we're, we're in the process of uh, kind of rebooting at the moment. So until now, it's kind of been very organic. Um, we've kind of built a small community to try and build content in the most important kind of areas that we felt were lacking. Um, but we're trying to kind of build a, a better, broader system at the moment. So uh, um, and and find a way of kind of rewarding people in the right way who are producing content that's valuable to the rest of the community. Um, and so we'll, we're going to be launching a program in the next couple of months with, around exactly that. So um, our team will then be responsible just for kind of moderating rating and, and helping manage and guide that community um, and uh, yeah we're kind of very keen then to start uh, finding uh, like you say local guides um, brands uh, we're, we're looking at doing something with local stores as well uh, so like for example in mountain biking it might be the local bike rental store and uh, who want to kind of who are, the, who are the who are the probably the people who get asked the most what routes they would recommend and so building uh, a system where where they can contribute routes but also uh, perhaps have their business discovered more easily uh, as well on the platform so it's uh, something, yeah, we'd, we'd love to talk to, to anyone who, who wants to kind of help contribute and, and particularly as we're shaping that program at the moment. Um, if I may uh, continue on the question, how do we um, like keep informed on that program? So we'll be, uh, now that's a good question. Probably the best thing um, to do is I'll post the link to sign up as a local ambassador, and then our team will keep you in. Uh, I'll post that. I'll go and find the link and post it here in a minute in the chat, um, and then our team can keep you keep you posted. And we'll actually post something 
publicly about the program. Um, it, mostly it will probably be kicked off by um, someone often people will actually just produce their first route by going on the web, producing a route and choosing to publish it. And then we'll, we'll look at who's already active and how we can help them be, be more active as well. Uh, the question was, uh, how do individuals join or opt in to be part of the route tracking for their own routes or avoid their route being included in the system? So uh, you can, there are a number of ways you can, you can track a track something in the app using the mobile app, just using the recording function. You can connect today a Garmin or a Sunto watch, and or you can also connect your Strava account. Um, there are certain restrictions we have on the way we use Strava data. So um, those don't appear in any feeds or, or route search. You only get to see that um, personally. Um, you can control the visibility of your content um, either in bulk or um, or per activity. So you can choose which ones remain private to you or which ones uh, then become kind of publicly uh, available for people to see either on your profile um, or in the kind of local uh, heat maps. Um, and so you can, you can simply choose what you want to see and not see. Um, we're also working kind of related to, which is related to the question of seeing content from route makers you trust. We're also working on um, the ability to, so that you can choose maybe a, a, su a subset of people who can see uh, your content uh, that you want, you want to share that with. If you're allowing people to upload directly from their watches, I mean, some watch tracks are terrible. They, they you know, they, they zigzag all over the place. So uh, doesn't that kind of degrade the quality of the information that's then available? I guess we see those two things as like almost slightly different different things. So the or, or information used for slightly different purposes. One like a, a route is kind of like a very well crafted, prepared entry, but it won't tell you anything about um, whether it's currently been done recently or doable or whatever. And so we see those kind of as two almost like complementary sets of information. One is yeah, is kind of a an entry of record, so to speak, and the other one um, is is really just like a small piece of information and, and you're right like some of them will be better than others um the watches are getting better and better now um and particularly like we only rely one of the things that we specifically do is we only rely on the 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 lat long so the x and y coordinate and the terrain provides the 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 elevation data um that we use so um it's better than you would think, I would say. Um, and you can kind of see from, from, from that map that I showed, like generally speaking, the routes are, are pretty good and it will tell you that someone went there. Um, yeah, so, and I think that that's just gonna get better and better and better um, because a lot of the watches, particularly the latest devices use accelerometers to improve the GPS fix um, so, that, so that it doesn't jump around as much. They've got much better noise uh, reduction algorithms. So, um, but yeah, I mean, and also take everything you see with it, the community stuff with a pinch of salt but it like the way we like to think about it is all of this is just like more information for you to make your own decision with um and and we just try and make it really clear what it is you're looking at um and part of the community enablement will be you being able to actually perhaps like uh, ask ask that person a question or whatever within within the platform one of the slides you put up was the um, Aigui de Republique. And I, I flicked into it on Fat Map actually while you've been talking. The, um, the description of the route is from camp to camp, um, but it's in English and it's, it's unusably bad. Um, I guess that's one of the challenges with community uh -huh. platforms. So like, and, and so why we, we make it clear that one's from, from camp to camp. Uh, I mean, two things, few things, there's, there's a few things we're doing. We're trying to kind of, sort all of this out at the moment has been kind of the first the lack of information was the problem now it's kind of either too much or or, or consistency of quality so um i'll try to explain what we're, we're doing so a number of different things number one is um we're starting on internationalization we just released the app in french language italian is coming in about a week's time and german will be coming before uh, the end of march um, and followed by uh, spanish and, and, and some other languages um, shortly after so the app will be translated and then the same will be true of content so we'll be able to use content in its native language rather than have it auto translated but allow people to auto translate within the app um, if 
for example, the translation is the problem. Um, the other thing we're doing is to try and uh, tier the type of uh, root information. So uh, the top tier will be what we call FatMap Select, which is basically content that's been validated um, and is, is of, an, of a very high quality. Um, if it's a ski touring route or an alpine climbing route, it's literally been reviewed by um, a, a high mountain guide. Um, and so that's a kind of, you know, the, the first kind of mark of quality. And then the, there'll be other content um, that's been validated as as good enough quality so that it's actually got a decent description or something but not officially validated and then there'll be kind of the third tier which is like what we would call kind of community content um to be honest we're still kind of getting to grips with you know where do you draw the line between just not showing anything at all or showing someone something that's part of the information they can use in their planning um so i was just in interested by the fact that you're using the stereoscopic um, satellite data. Um, how do you find that um, for the detail on very steep faces? So for climbing and mountaineering, you're going to get near vertical faces, but I guess that most of the imagery is fairly straight down the, the nadir. Um, so do you do anything additional to uh, add detail to that, or do you just um, just take it as is? Increasingly, what's happened uh, since we first started building data through the stereoscope satellite imagery is there's just more and more better and better actual elevation data sets. Um, and we're starting to integrate those into the product. So like an example of that is Swiss Topo actually has a, a one meter elevation data set that's produced from aerial survey. Um, and uh, that's now made completely freely available. Uh, and so we're doing some work at the moment so that we can ingest that. And so rather than using um, elevation data that we calculate or fallback elevation data, we actually have a radar generated five meter model for areas um, that, that we don't have better data for. Um, we'll use those data sets. Um, and there's actually, we're working on a project at the moment to be able to kind of aggregate um, the huge amount of fantastic data that's out there. For example, there's, a, there's some amazing um, LIDAR surveys. So this is uh, data that's very, very high resolution collected from a survey, um, an aerial survey where they use a laser to, to, to create very detailed terrain data and that's all being made freely available by the US government um, in, in the US and, the, and the loads of governments are following suit now to basically open up their data. Norway's just done the same. Um, and so it's actually becoming less da elevation data that we have to produce and more an exercise of aggregating all of the publicly available data uh, to build a very, very high resolution map. The, that's, I guess, one of the unique things about what we're able to do by owning a map platform, because you're, some other products have started to integrate um, some 3D maps from like third party platforms like Mapbox, um, and that data is of a, of a lower resolution. Uh, so it's kind of cool for visualization, but it's not very good for decision making um, in, in mountains. So we, we hope we'll have like a, a much higher resolution um, set of data for, for, for many, many more places over the course of this year. Okay, thanks. So you're, you're relying on um, bringing in standard external sources rather than trying to create your own data. Um, yeah, you're not, exactly. You're, you're, not, you're not going and flying places or anything like that. No, I mean, I think what we'll, we, we possibly will start do we did do that uh, for some proof of concepts, like the, the the challenge is basically is that there's a the economics of it are tricky. So you need to that 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 area needs to be valuable enough to a large number of people, um, and so uh, I think we'll we'll we've we've had a few projects where we might want to use actually drone captured data, um, but there's starting to be more and more aerial surveys that are producing really really high quality 3D data. Um, so uh, one of the uh, Kind of give you just the, the bit the kind of the, the technicalities of the platform is like when you use stereoscopic satellite imagery and build essentially an elevation map and you put satellite imagery over the top the way we do in the platform now it's actually what technically what you would call like 2.5d um, because the imagery is stretched by the elevation model a bit like one of those things you when you those pin things you'd put your hand in uh, which a little so you you get you stretch the imagery um, and you lose data 
uh, as you say, on some steep faces, um, but increasingly there, there is actual true 3D data. Um, and we're looking at being able to integrate that into the platform over time. So that would give you like actual proper imagery on vertical faces uh, and, and other, other such stuff. So you can actually, Google Earth has actually done that in, in the, some areas as a proof of concept. Uh, part of Chamonix around the Agri de Midi, Google Earth has done that for, and it's, 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 it's pretty impressive. So we, we want to start to integrate that kind of data um, into the platform as well. Well, yes, I've gone about, I'm just wondering whether, when you're, you've mentioned all these data sources, is, is anything come up while you've been doing it, where you look at it and go, blimey, that's either very good or very bad, and and then sort of, uh, you know, you've had to do it, and, and then either have to go back to them and say, we do realise there's a problem. Has anything like that occurred? And my other question was about climate. You mentioned uh, the climate challenge that you're doing at the end. It's, a very useful tool. It fits in nicely with the Eagle policy on um, the carbon footprint. Because if you were able to load on top of a tool a carbon footprint of that tool that you were doing, with, especially if it was a week long tool and all that sort of thing. So, two questions there. Yeah, thanks. Um... So the, the, the answer to the first question is yes, there's definitely that the, the data is one of the, the the hardest like balances to strike between reliable data and like overall data coverage. Um, the biggest problem we have at the moment, um, for anyone who's spent much time in the Dolomites, we'll see that there are problems with the elevation data we have there. Um, and it's pretty obvious. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, there are also no Italian topographic maps available. Um, and so there's the, 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 there is a, a reliability problem with that. The best information we have there is using like the global topo um, overlay, which, which is basically made of slightly lower resolution elevation data, but it's, it's, it's uh, possibly... Um, less erroneous but yeah those are things that over time we're just going and and, and improving um as as we go uh, and and i think the the cost is coming down very quickly um at the moment for producing that there's more and more um satellites being launched that are addressing this problem and so when we started it it was literally 84 dollars per square kilometer to produce um to produce the <laughs> a, a map um and you can see that adds up pretty quickly um now that that's starting to be, um, you know, fractions of, of, of that cost. So um, hopefully all those those unreliable areas will get get ironed out. Um, and I think your second question was was about kind of sustainability. This has been like a big, um, you know, topic of conversation for us because like it's one of like the kind of obvious core values for, 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 for the company and obviously all of us that, that love the outdoors want to do that responsibly and this like how do we a strike this balance of, of helping more people access these places um, but do that in a sustainable way uh, and, and that's one of the reasons we feel a subscription product is because we noticed that the, there are lots of problems with the the social networks that are driven by advertising revenue that when one piece of content gets popular it actually that popularity gets reinforced and that's where you kind of get these these kind of overcrowding of, of spots that are happening in in some places um today and so we purposefully decided we would build a model where people pay for the product which would kind of drive us to therefore like make the product that that the people value that actually adds value to the, the community as a whole um and we're trying to look at more and more what we can do from a sustainability perspective without making it kind of a token um, gesture. So we're, we're all ears to, to, to ideas and suggestions. I think that's a great idea about like trying to have some way of understanding the kind of, I don't, not sure how we would calculate that possibly if the, with lift access, if lift access was used, we could, we could try and do something. Um, but one of the things we're doing for the with with the kind of premium subscription is looking at how we we already do one percent for the planet, um, the the but we're we're looking at what more we could do to maybe actually start to give a portion to 
uh, of, of the subscription towards like in kind of sustainability and environmental causes that are chosen by the community. So um, we, we haven't quite finalized what we want to do, but we would love, we'd like to do something more substantial there over time. Yeah, it's just, uh, I was thinking since you have so, uh, so much data on terrain and near and even off uh, already charted routes, uh, have you thought if maybe that uh, can be useful in that type of scenario? Or is it, uh, does it require more precision in order to be able to take uh, this type of responsibility to guide people towards uh, people in trouble, that kind of stuff? It seems like a broad question, so I don't want to present too much. <laughs> You're already mounting people, you know what I mean. <laughs> no, 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 to totally understand. So um, I think there's, there's three things we're doing around this. Um, one is we've started to integrate with devices. So Garmin was the first, and we're looking at what we, how we can integrate with the inReach um, better, both for... Um, actually the person using the inReach but also people who are seeing the inReach data if you're sharing your live location um, the second thing we're doing is looking at how we like one of the ways we see the uh, long-term uh, vision of fat map is whereas we would say where the alpine club was kind of for the alpinist like we there's there's a kind of a new consumer coming into the outdoors and we we're trying to create this really as as, as a global club for the outdoors and that might also in, in involve search and rescue coverage so basically a, an insurance cover um that uh, that is available to all members and that would be directly able to be requested from within the app um so the third thing is making basically a very easy um way to know uh, where and how to call the rescue with kind of a guided functionality. When, when we talk to people like the PGHM here in Chamonix, it's actually often the, the real basics that cause the biggest problems. So the things they, they tell us is it's actually the information that people impart when they need rescuing is the thing that creates the biggest challenges with the rescue. So just having a kind of guided experience uh, that allows, uh, can reminds people what information they should, should, should be communicating with the, the rescue services and how um so it's also yeah uh, 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 one of the other things we'd like to improve mm -hmm.